I tell people all the time, like everybody that wants to hop into entrepreneurship, it is not for the faint of heart. It is like you can become a millionaire from your nine to five and it'll be so much easier. So it's definitely like a passion project. Like it's something that I'm committed to doing because I see the benefit and I see the people it can help. But it's challenging and I do what I can. And so that's my model. Like I do what I can. I set aside a certain amount of time a day to do it and I do it. And I have been extremely blessed. Like I said, I didn't intentionally decide to build a brand or a business, but a lot of things have fallen in my lap and it has opened being in this business and on this side of the world and experiences has opened up the world of opportunity to me to things that I never even knew was possible for myself. And so I love that I have done that. But just like the things that have really helped me is having really clear boundaries, like this is how much I'm going to work on it. This is how much energy that I'm going to put towards it. Understanding the things that I'm strong in and the things that I need to hire help around. And then understanding what opportunities aren't going to be really good fits for me or things that I've had to do. But I mean, like, (laughs) I love being a nurse and everybody's always asking me, is your goal to leave nursing? Not necessarily, because I really feel like nursing is the ultimate way to (laughs) become financially independent because of the flexibility. And it's still my passion. It's still what fuels me. And I love bringing life into the world. So I probably won't do that, but I'm excited to also see where my entrepreneurship journey takes me. And I know in the past you've shared the struggles that definitely Black people, probably Black and brown people deal with when it comes to the treatment that we get, right? Mm -hmm. You also shared that you having this financial cushion gives you an opportunity to be more vocal about those. Yes. Talk to me about that. And also having the privilege of having a platform to speak about it where people can listen, right? I have a kind of have a public voice, but yeah, I've experienced some things within my career that I've seen a lot of black and brown people being mistreated by the medical system. I've seen my own family members being mistreated, but in this country, we do have black maternal morbidity and mortality crisis that is astounding. Like we are worse than most third world countries when it comes to our death rates for infants and mothers. And I've witnessed firsthand how that happens. I've experienced firsthand how that happens despite my education, despite my financial means, despite my access to good providers, resources, health insurance, all of those things. These things still happen, but what being in a financial position means for me is that I'm not afraid to be an advocate, to be an advocate for my patients. And I've seen so many nurses cower away from doing that because they don't have the financial means to do that, but I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to speak up for myself. I'm not afraid to speak up for my kids and my family members because I also have the financial means to fight those people. And so that's what being in a good financial position has afforded me. Definitely. I think you should, as much as possible, continue to do this work, right? Because yes, yes. one is in your position. And I remember once looking at the statistics and it's really scary. It's yeah. very scary and it's very real. And I will continue to talk about it because it's, especially as I'm pregnant right now, it's things that I'm currently facing. Like it's just devastating. First of all, yes, our healthcare system is broken. So a lot of people are treated very poorly by our healthcare system. But when you see that black and brown women are dying at three to four times higher, moms and babies are dying at three to four times higher rates than white women and white babies, it is a crisis. This is a crisis and it's something that I will not stop talking about. And guess what? Yes, all lives matter. But when you're able to effectively improve the care for black and brown people, your care will subsequently improve too. So I don't like it when people are just like, why are you making it? This is not just a black thing. Well, I'm talking about something that directly affects black moms and babies. And if I can improve that, you'll get better care too. So I won't stop talking about it until it changes. And I don't see it changing in my lifetime, but hopefully it'll change for my kids. Love that. So 
you know, you live in a very high cost of living area. You mentioned that you live in California, right? But you somehow keep your housing expenses low. How do you do that? I always believe in like, I think that the two biggest things that you can do to really maximize your take-home pay, which is what it's really about, because that's what you have to invest in to build wealth, is to minimize your two biggest expenses, which is going to be your housing costs and your transportation cost. And so anytime I have a place, like I have a house, I always have space that I rent out to another fellow nurse who nurses, let me tell you, we're still the most trustworthy profession, even though they're trying to shade nurses after this whole COVID thing. But that's another story. They come, they work, they're quiet, they're respectful, they're background checked because I have kids in here. And all those things, I always have a room that I rent out to nurses. And that drastically helps reduce my housing costs. But I always look for housing if I'm renting or buying that is going to fall within a certain range, right? I think a lot of people use the excuse that they live in a high cost of living area. Therefore, they can justify being house poor. But there are so many different ways that you can be creative in these spaces so that you're not spending a majority of your income on your housing. I know also I've seen on social that you talk to your kids and teach your kids about money and building wealth. What are some tips you have for parents or uncles and aunties? I think that the whole thing is to like normalize the conversation about wealth, right? About talking about money. And it has to be very age appropriate. You see, my daughters are young. I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. So there's only a certain amount of things that they can grasp, but I speak to them at their level. So what I do is, is that kids recognize brands as soon as they can talk. I mean, I'm sure they can recognize it before they can talk. They know what a McDonald's signs look like. They know what a Barbie doll is. They know these things. And if they can recognize those signs and it's not reading, they're not reading, they're just recognizing it, then they can recognize that not only can they be a consumer of that, but they can actually own those things it kind of changes the way that they approach things and the way that they think. And even if they don't necessarily 100% grasp the ownership, but my eight-year-old does, my four-year-old doesn't necessarily understand ownership. She knows she's buying something that she likes, but she's buying it in a way that is going to benefit her for the future. And so I do things like my kids, are; their college funds are already set for these two kids. This one is another situation. But they each, I decided, I determined that they would each have $100,000 in their account for college and either will cash flow or we'll figure out how to fund the rest of that if they choose to go to college. They have that set, right? That's already done. 